and I will keep the chat window on the screen so I can see if you ask any questions. So if I don't respond to your question in the chat while I'm at the slide, then please just uh, raise your voice and speak loud. We are only, we are 13 people, so we are 14 people, so just speak loud when, if you have a question. So I just moved a bit around here, and then I will start. Okay. So hybrid task uh, set scheduling. This is where we a more realistic situation because having only periodic threats, then you have a hard time dealing with the events of your system. For instance, uh, you could have alarms. So how do you treat an alarm in your schedule? It would be a very bad thing just to have an alarm task running in every period because then you waste a lot of time. So the most people, they allow uh, a priori task to come by and make room for that in the schedule. And this is where we look at uh, strategies for doing that in this uh, little presentation of section 2.2. So typically we have alarms, but also user inputs, you know, we are running control loops of 10 milliseconds typically, or, or 100 milliseconds. So you do a lot of work, uh, at least uh, 100 times a second or, or 10 times a second for a normal work in an embedded control application. But then from time to time, the user decides to press a button. But between these buttons uh, pressed by the user, you could have minutes of time. So this, it happens very seldom. So if you look at the time scale, this is similar to just uh, look at the sky in the night and wait for a supernova. Last time we saw a supernova on the clear sky was uh, Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomers who saw it in, I think it was uh, year 1300 and something, uh, 500 years ago. And there was one supernova 1000 years ago noticed by you know, some Chinese astronomers. So. For the time point of view of the uh, of the CPU and your application, then user inputs are so as rare as supernovas are for you. You will hardly notice one in your lifetime. So these uh, apparatus can be very seldom and occur very seldom. So that's why we have to deal with them in a special way, because when they arrive, they there should be room for it in the schedule that we treat them. But sometimes they arrive in, in huge numbers. And that is, this is what we're going to look at in chapter four, when we look at overload situations. And these are typically co often caused by a lot of apparatus tasks arriving at the exact same time. At the Three Mile uh, uh, nuclear power plant in the United States, when they had this uh, near meltdown of the kernel, they had so many alarms in the first 10 minutes that in the first five minutes that the guy, poor guys in the control room didn't know, didn't know what was happening. Every, every red line was blinking in the room. So they were just confused what was going on. So they were clearly overloaded. And we can have a situation for an embedded system like that also. But apart from all other situations, we still have to deal with these apparatus tasks. And this is what this section is about. So gradually we come closer and closer to the real life situation. First, we assumed that in section two, one, in chapter two, we assume that all the tasks, they are independent. In chapter three, we'll lift that assumption and work with dependent tasks. But yeah, we lift the assumption that all the, uh, the tasks are periodic and allow for apparatus tasks also. And then we'll see how we deal with them. Yes, a long talk to begin with, but let's start. So as I said before, hybrid tasks is a task set where we have both periodic tasks and some just popping in from time to time. And they don't have a period. And we have two cases. If these apparatus tasks have soft time constraints, 
most user inputs is a bit soft time because the users, they expect a reaction typically within a second or two, but uh, if it takes three seconds, they might uh, allow that for also. But if you let a user wait for five seconds, then the user will become violent and start kicking or, or beating the button or pressing it uh, 10 times instead of one times and so on. So users are a nuisance, you know. We hate users when we're doing software. This is the worst thing we can think of. But we have to lay, put up uh, these users because they have the money that pays our wages, you know. So we still have to be polite and treat users nice, even if we don't want to. We hate them. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we aim at, if you have soft, soft time constraints, is that we provide a good average response time. So this will typically be a best effort algorithm. So we will tr treat this apparatus as nice as we can and try to do our best service. But we have another case. If the apparatus have a hard deadline, this means that when they come, we have to answer as a system within, for instance, 10 milliseconds. This is typically what happens when you receive an alarm in an embedded system. An alarm will typically have a deadline. And if you're not acknowledging an alarm within, for instance, uh, uh, five milliseconds, then something really bad will happen. Then you get an, a lot of other alarms. So alarms is a, uh, typically an average task which has, uh, have, has a hard deadline. Because if you don't uh, acknowledge the alarms, then uh, the system self-destructs will start. The famous example is the Ariane 5 ray rocket, which they sent up from uh, northern Brasilia, the French uh, company did that. And uh, they went from uh, Ariane uh, 3 rockets to Ariane 4 rockets, I think. And uh, they changed the computer system, but they just moved the, the hardware. They just moved the software directly to the new hardware. And they didn't check it very well. So they didn't run it in a simulator. But the new hardware was five times as fast as the old hardware was. So the bus became overloaded with course corrections messages. And uh, the main controller was swamped with all these messages. And then there were the surveillance uh, uh, chip, the surveillance computer saw that uh, it, everything went bad. And uh, after a very, very short time, it decided to blow up the rocket. And this happened exactly uh, 37 seconds after start. So there was a big explosion in the sky. And uh, the loss was uh, billions of kroner. And then afterwards, they wanted to figure out what was wrong with this rocket. They put the software in the simulator. And exactly 30 seconds after in the simulator, they discovered that the system was swamped with aperiodic message tasks and uh, that, is, uh, that the surveillance computer decided to blow up the rocket for safety reasons. Yeah, so this is a warning from real life that you have to do your job as, an, um, as a real-time programmer of embedded system. You have to do it very well. Yeah, so the first thing will, uh, the first section in this chapter, in this section of the ch chapter, will be to deal with soft a priori task set. Soft a priori tasks. The first uh, method we look at is background scheduling. If you don't know better, this is the first thing which comes to your mind. So <clears throat> you take the a priori schedule task which arrives and put them into the schedule where no priori tasks are, are ready to execute. This means the idle part of the, of the schedule. And the strategy here is that you queue, you put them into a queue on arrival time. So you serve the every task on the first, first serve strategy. And let's see an example of this. We have a, a nice example of that here. So up here we have our three priority tasks. So the first one has a period of five. The next one has a period of 10. And the last, yeah, next one is period of 10 and so on. We have these two priority tasks. 
And we can notice the idle times in the schedule. They are here from four to five and from seven to 10. And from 14 to 15 is also idle and from 17 to 20. So these are our idle times in the schedule. And then we have some arrival on some apparel tasks at, uh, at time four, uh, tau three will arrive. It has a computation time of two. And you can see this is the amount of time it has to do its work. So we have this time available, so it will do half of its work from four to five, and then do the rest of the work from seven to eight. So there's the idle time in the schedule again. So at 10, uh, tau four arrives. It has an execution time of one, but you can see at 10, the schedule is not idle because tau one is executing, then tau two is executing, but then we have an idle time from 14 to 15, and then we put in tau three four to execute. At 11, the tau five arrives. It has an execution time of two. You can see it here. And the next available uh, point in the available slot in the, the schedule is from 17 to 20. And there we put tau five into execute here. And this is background scheduling. So this is one reason that you shouldn't fill up your schedule too much. You should keep a percentage uh, free. And you can see in this schedule, we have one, four, five, eight out of 20 as idle time. So, so this will be 40% idle time in the schedule. And then now we have room for serving every task when they come. And you can see some has to wait more than others. For instance, tau five has to wait uh, six time units before it can be executed. Whereas uh, tau three got immediately immediate response because we had a, a slot of idle time directly when it arrived. So we cannot guarantee any response time with the background scheduling, but we serve them as they come. Yeah, you can ask questions in the chat. I have the chat open on my screen now. The next time, uh, this not knowing when you can get uh, get your work done is a bit uh, nuisance. So we introduced task servers. So we set aside some bandwidth, so uh, not bandwidth, some time in the schedule to serve apparel tasks. So we know that we can serve them. So a task server is a periodic task whose purpose is to serve apparel tasks. So we, we built some software which uh, receives apparel tasks in this uh, periodic uh, task server and uh, they are served within the capacity of this one. So the server capacity is just the time that we have set aside for this priority task, the computation time it has. And the server is scheduled with the algorithm used for the priority tasks. So, yeah. This is, uh, yeah. Typically, you will schedule it with the highest priority to make sure that it works, but then it, uh, then it disturbs the scheduling algorithm a bit. And there's some, some considerations in the book about this, which are a bit strange. I will come to that later in the later slides. Yeah. So the ordering of the aperiodic request does not depend on scheduling algorithms used for the priority tasks. As you saw in before, with the background scheduling, they were just served in first come first served basis. So let's have a look at them. The first one they present is the polling server. So it has a period when it becomes, after that period, it becomes active again. And it serves those pending. This means they arrived every task requests, as many as it can within its, its, limit, its limits of its execution time, the capacity here. But if there were no every tasks away, uh, hanging around, then it just suspends itself. And then in the next period, it wakes up again and see if, if there are any average tasks to, to serve and then they do it if someone has arrived. 
Yeah, let's see an example of this again. So, yeah, it's a priority task, or server, that is tau, uh, tau s. You can see a little s here, denoting that this is the tau, uh, tau server. And you can see the capacity is two, and the period of the task server is five. And you can see at zero, uh, there were no uh, apparent task hanging around, so it just suspended itself. And then tau two, tau one and tau two can make use of it. And you can see we are using rate monitoring scheduling because tau two has the highest priority because it has the shortest period. Yeah. So tau two will execute. And then tau, five, tau one will execute. At tau five, the task server wakes up again and uh, is ready to serve some tasks. And you can see at, uh, at time four, tau three uh, arrived, yeah, as execution time of two. So it will be served by the task server in this interval. At uh, time 10, it wakes up again, the task server. And notice this task server has higher priority than tau two. When it's a rate monitoring scale, you can see the period of the task server is shorter than the period of tau two. So of course it will have higher priority. So tau four arrives at 10, it will be served here because it will not suspend itself because we had something to do as a task server. Then tau five will come around. It has execution tau of two, but we only have capacity to take do the half of it. So tau five will have to wait until 15 for the rest of the work. And you can see the server capacity uh, specified down here. At five, it was uh, two, but at seven, we have used up the capacity. So it's about that down at zero again. And uh, at 10, we had full work to do. So the capacity goes down to zero at 12. But up here, the capacity is still one. But the polling server don't uh, do anything with this uh, unused capacity. But the deferred server and uh, the next servers will use the rest of the capacity if there's any, anything left. So this is how it works. So at 20, the, uh, the task server will come again. Can you explain why tau 5 doesn't finish? for the aperiodic task. So five does not finish? Because uh, it has a higher priority, right? Yeah, but uh, the task server here, you see, the task server has a capacity of two. Okay, yeah, okay. And tau four has used for a time from 10 to 11, and then there's only one time unit left. So you have to, the rest of work has to wait until 15. So this is a very simple server, but the drawback is that that some task has to wait a bit to be to be served. For instance, here, task three had to wait one time unit until five because before it could be executed. The next one improves on that. It's called the deferrable server. So it is an extension of the polling server and it's intended to improve the response time of appropriate uh, requests. So it doesn't suspend itself if there's no one hanging around of these appropriate tasks. So it preserves its capacity. This means when an appropriate task request enters the system, yeah, after it has suspended itself, yeah, if no one is around it, of course, don't occupy time in the CPU. Then the task server will wake up and execute it immediately. So the difference here for five, because if it was a deferrable server, then it will be, if of course there's nothing to do, it will not do anything, but it will stay uh, ready. It has a capacity of two. So the moment that tau three steps into at four, then it will, uh, tau three will be executed because it has a capacity of two left. So it will just do it here. 
And because it has the highest priority, tau three will be executed from four to, to six if you had a deferrable server. So in this way, we improve the response time of the library tasks. Yeah, and now comes some uh, calculations which are a bit strange, in my opinion. So look at this sentence. However, the deferrable server violates a basic assumption of the rate monitoring algorithm. Yes. This assumption is a priority task must execute whenever it is the highest priority task ready to run. Otherwise, a lower priority task could miss its deadline. So here, he looks at the original schedule where we had tau one and tau two, and says that now we put a burden on this. So when we do the criteria, we look at the utilization in the rate monitoring scheduling of the tasks. And this should be less than uh, this 83% if you have two tasks. But when we put in the, the task server, then uh, we don't have that much time available anymore because it has the highest priority. So it disturbs tau two, which has the highest priority. So if we only had tau one and tau two, then tau two will execute whenever it's ready because it has the highest priority. But this is not true anymore because the deferrable server will actually come into place. If it uh, has something to do, then it will delay the highest priority uh, periodic task. So back and forth here means that we have to reduce uh, the uh, upper limit of the utilization in the criteria. And they put this formula in, so we have to reduce it. Normally, if you uh, use the lazy version of a criteria, you just require that the utilization should be less than LN2, that is this uh, 69%. So we have to reduce that. And we reduce it by putting in uh, this US and this uh, 2 US, putting this into the formula. You can see. If US is zero, then uh, you have the, the number two inside here. So it's backwards compliant to, to the normal criteria if we don't have a task server. But if we put in US here, these terms, this instead of two, you will get a, a lower number here. And US, this utilization of the task server. And this is defini normal definitions of U. So I'm a bit puzzled. Why is this not true for the other servers? So if you look at the polling server here, it is put as the highest priority, high priority than tau one and tau two. So tau two will suffer. You can see it suffers here. It has to wait from 10 to 12 to 12 to do its work. So it doesn't start immediately when it's ready to run. So in my little head, in my little humble head, we should also do this for the, the for the <clears throat> for the polling server, and also for the next one. Because when we introduce a uh, a server, then we reduce the time that the other tasks, the priority task, can use for their job. So frankly speaking, this reduction in the criteria should also be done for the other service. Yeah. So let me know if you have another opinion than me. Sporadic server. It's another uh, server technique. And they state in the book, which improves the response time of apparatus task requests. It does it in the same way as a deferrable server. If they, it has some capacity, the library tasks will be served right when it arrives. And they claim that it improves the response to our library task without degrading the processor utilization factor of the periodic task set. What? When you have this project server running around, it uses time 
and in this time it goes away from the periodic tasks. So I'm very puzzled by this statement. Because like the deferrable server, this prior server preserves the capacity until an apparatic request occurs. Yes, so it, when it wakes up at the beginning of, the, of, of its period and no one is uh, around, then it just stays ready. Yeah, as Trump said to the, to the proud boys, stay, stay back, stay back and stay ready. This is exactly the same policy we have here. So the deferrable server will wait and uh, go into action when an uh, apparatic task uh, pops up. You know, the deferrable server, it got the capacity back after one period, but we have a strange rule here for the sporadic server. We talk about a replenishment time. So there's a interval from T release it becomes active and then its capacity uh, yeah, is greater than zero. The replenishment time is set to TR plus the server period. And uh, this is uh, typically uh, a longer period than uh, the normal uh, periods of the uh, periodic tasks. Yeah, and the replenishment amount is set to the capacity consumed in the interval from its released and the time when the sporadic system becomes idle or its capacity has been exhausted. Yeah, it's a long complex statement. And let's have a look in the next slide where we have a picture of it so we better can understand what's going on. So here we have a sporadic server. And as you can see, in the start, we don't use up the capacity. So the capacity, capacity is, is two. You can see we have a capacity of two up here. The period is set to five here. But the idea of it is that it should be longer than the normal period. But just, this is just an example to, to tell you. So <clears throat> after time four, at uh, time four, uh, tau three arrives. And because we have unused capacity, the sporadic server will serve it in the schedule. And notice it has a higher priority than tau one up here. So it will stop tau one for these two time units. And we'll continue until the capacity is used up. And you can see it has two uh, time units to do uh, of work. And then the capacity will be used up at six here. Yeah, so at 10, you see it will be from this time point, the replenishment time is calculated from when you start using up the capacity, start using the capacity and then this uh, period of five. So at nine, it will be filled up again. So the deferrable server, as you saw in the previous one, as a, yeah, sorry, the polling server, it will be filled, capacity, capacity will be filled up at the start of each period. But here, the replenishment rule says that from the time that you're using it, you will fill it up a bit later. So if you are an uh, apparatus task arriving, then you know for sure if you have more, more to do than the capacity of the, of the sporadic server, then you at most have to wait these five time units until you can be served again. So this is improvement over the deferrable server that you have this maximum of time. You know that for sure. So it looks a bit like a deadline, but it's not a deadline. So you have a response time. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Victor? Yeah. At the end there, uh, yeah. after, after the last task in this case, the first yeah. prior server, why doesn't, the, why doesn't the person go back up? At six? Uh, at um, 15. At 15? Yeah, but I'll come yeah. to that later. Please wait, I'll explain it. I'm just, uh, just explaining here now. I'll come to that later. Yeah, so at nine, the bucket will be filled again, so to speak. It's the replenishment, you fill in some capacity because this is the period 
the replenishment time is from this, to, uh, from four to nine. So now the capacity is full up again, but there's no uh, uh, apparatus tasks in the queue, you see. So four will arrive at 10. So at 10, it will start executing tau four. And at 11, you can see we have used up the half of our capacity. And then at 11, tau five arrives, uses up the rest of the capacity until 12. And then we have to wait until the, re the, re the replenishment time has elapsed. And replenish time is from when you start using it. So we have this five here up to, up to 15. So from 10 to 15, you have to wait. And then it's uh, full up again. So it's at full capacity at 15. You can see we had one time unit left for, for tau five. And we only done one time unit up here. So we have time, one time unit left, and this will go to be executed here in the schedule. So at 16, we have used up half of the, of the server capacity. So the server capacity is only one, and there's nothing else to do in the schedule. Does this answer uh, your question, Victor? Uh, I don't see why it doesn't, why it doesn't just automatically finish the server capacity. I, I don't understand what you're saying, Victor. So here, you don't understand why Tau 5 does not finish. Or what? Tau 5 starts at, at 11. You can see there's only no, no, one no, no, no. time unit left. After Tau 5. After. After time what? After Tau 5 has finished. Yeah. There's still one time unit left of, in the yeah. capacity. You can see? And this remains constant. Why don't you automatically reset the capacity then? No, because, yeah, at, uh, you know, at 20, yeah, we should, uh, at 20, it goes up again. You see? They are not shown it. They, they stop drawing it at 20. But at 20, it will go up to two again. Why doesn't it perform that? Yeah, but it, it did up, it went up to 15 here and here. So I mean, after the time has a- Why doesn't it do it between 16 and 20? Well, yeah. it nothing to do. Yeah, but uh, you have used the half of the capacity. But the idea is that uh, if, if you just fill it up right away, then uh, this, uh, Sporadic server could uh, take all the time, you know, if you have a lot of apparatus tasks arriving. There should also be time for the normal tasks. That's why we have these rules. It's actually more to limit this. Yeah, so you have to wait. Server. Yeah, you have to, yes, you have to wait the replenishing time until you, you, you can do it again. Because this is safety against overload. Otherwise, you just fill up the schedule, the apparatus task if you have to, uh, too many. There was another question uh, also. Yeah, I have a question. In the, in the last slide, I uh, said that uh, the server replenishes its capacity each time TR. And I was wondering what is TR here? Yeah. In, in our example. Yeah, but TR, for my, I read it as a T release. Okay. This time it becomes active. Yeah. So here, TR here will be five, four. It becomes active here because the tau three arrives. So TR will be four here. And then the replenishment will be four plus five. And then you get a full capacity again at nine. And, and so this replenishing time is equal to, to T? Uh, the capital T that we have for the server. Yeah, wait, 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 the bridge. See, how, the I mean, how do we time. define this uh, replenishing time? Can we change it's, it or is it just... No, no. Uh, replenish time is set to TR plus the server period. Okay, TR is not the replenishment time. TR is the release of the sporadic server. Oh, okay. The replenishment time is set to TR plus the server period. 
So in his in this figure, we can see replenishment time here is from four to nine. So yes. after, so at nine, you will get a full capacity again. It's similar to a bucket. You use up the water in your bucket, and then at six, it will be empty. And then after f uh, five, for when you start using the bucket of water, then the bucket will be full again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the rule. A bit strange rule. Yeah. And they claim that because the 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 fill up will start a, a fixed period after arrival of the operating task, then it you get a slight you get a better response time compared to the de deferrable so. So so if it was a deferrable so then you had to wait until 10 instead. Yeah, now comes a joke. I uh, was down at the news conference at Simtivision. This is a dominating company who does uh, scheduling analysis for the big car industry in Germany and for aerospace industry. And I asked one of the senior engineers in the company, uh, well, how did they treat the task servers? And he looked at me, task servers, task what server? And the guy didn't know what I was talking about. Then I asked him, but how do you serve an average task? Okay, yes, he said, the way we do it, that we create a priority task, which just takes care of these apparatic requests. This is what they did it. And this is similar to what we write down here, a simple approach. So if an average task is associated with a critical event, which doesn't come too often, as I say, it's characterized minimal interval time, then the average task can be mapped onto a priority task and scheduled together with the priority task set. And this was the approach that uh, SimTivision has, uh, has used to deal with their Apparate tasks. Perhaps I have done something else now. It was uh, now six or seven years back I was down there. But uh, they didn't know about a uh, task I was down there. Remember, we are in academia. So these are uh, ways of dealing with the problem that researchers have suggested and published at conferences and discussed at conferences. It does not happen to be true in real life also. Okay, back again to our, yeah. Uh, so that was a sporadic server. So another way is uh, slack stealing. So we have the priority task scheduled with rate monitoring algorithm. And then we use the laxity of the priority task to push them a bit around so we can fit in our priority task. So let's see how we do it. The idea is very simple. So we have our two tasks up here, the priority task, tau one and tau two as before. And uh, you can see we have a slack here from two to five of task one. So in each period, there's a slack of uh, three or laxity of three in each period. And the same for, for tau two, we have a, a, slack, uh, a slack of eight in each period. We want to play around with this uh, uh, laxity. So you can see when tau three arrives at four, <clears throat> okay, we're lucky that we hit an idle time in the schedule from four to five, but we can continue with tau three by pushing the execution of tau one up here. If you just push it one time unit, then we can continue doing tau three. And that is uh, stealing the laxity of tau one, we just move it. You can see if tau three didn't do this, then it could start at five and it had a laxity from seven to 10 in spare time. Now we have stolen some of that laxity. So the laxity is down to two from eight to 10 now. So it says a smaller reserve time. And we can see it when tau four arrives at 10, then we push uh, tau one one time on the first, and then at 11, 
So far arrives, has two time units to execute. And again, we steal the, uh, the laxity from tau one. And you can see now tau one has no laxity left. It, uh, it executes from 13 to 15. So it just finished immediately before its deadline because we have stolen its laxity down here. Of course, the algorithm will take care of that we don't steal too much laxity because we shouldn't break the schedule. So if the execution time was three instead of two down here, then we will have had to wait until we had some laxity to steal again. And that would be at 19 or 20, from 19 to 20, if the execution time of tower five was free. So this is how slack stealing works. And this is a, a, a very uh, practical algorithm if you want to prioritize your apriori tasks. If you don't want to prioritize uh, apriori task or normal tasks, then we are back to the background and scheduling again. If you go back and have a look. So you can see the difference to the background scheduling is that we don't push uh, task one here. We don't push the execution. We just wait until we get a idle time in the schedule. So here we prioritize uh, task one and task two over the priority tasks. But in slack stealing, we prioritize the priority tasks. So this is a practical approach you can use in your software also directly. Yeah. So joint scheduling. This is another trick that uh, <coughs> we have an early deadline first schedule and then we just give uh, the average task arriving uh, an artificial uh, deadline as soon as possible without disturbing the rest of the tasks. So we create a fictive deadline in order to fit it into the earliest deadline first algorithm. And once we have thrown it into the, sched the scheduler, earliest deadline first scheduler, it will just treat it as a normal task. Look at it, because the earliest deadline first scheduler always look at the closest, at the task with the closest uh, deadline and put that to execute. So, so of course, we cannot set it too early because we, we can't ruin the schedule for those who are in the system. Yeah. So this is the art of setting the, the artificial deadline. Let's see how we do it in the schedule here. Yeah, now I talked a long time. Yeah, but I have very few slides left. I talked from 13.45. Hmm. Should we take a break? I can just pause the recording. Can we, I need to talk another 15 minutes. Is that okay? Or should we take a break? I continue. Okay. <clears throat> so we look at the joint scheduling technique. So when tau three arrives at four, we look in the schedule. So where can we put the artificial deadline? What we wanted to do is actually to put it just here after we have executed the stuff. This is the closest we can put it, FTT. Let's see if it works in the schedule. So we have a deadline at four. This is history. So the next deadlines to consider is the deadline of nine, uh, absolute deadline nine up here for tau one and the absolute deadline of tau two at, at eight here. So if you put the artificial deadline at six, we have to check that we don't disturb the schedule. And in this case, we don't disturb the schedule because tau two has done its job. So it's okay with that one. And we can see that tau one, if it starts after our deadline here, it still has time to do its job before it's deadline nine. 
So putting the artificial schedule at at six, the uh, artificial deadline at six will not disturb the schedule for tau one and tau two. So we just do that. And the consequence is that when the scheduler at four looks at which one is to execute now, it will look at the closest deadline. As is, up here it's closed deadline of nine. This has done its job. So it will uh, execute, ADF schedule will execute tau three. And we can see down here at tau four, at 10, tau four arrives. And we again try to put the uh, artificial schedule, uh, deadline for tau, tau four as close as possible. So we put it at 11 and we check, does this disturb the schedule? So at 10, at 11, you can see uh, at 10, there we have a deadline of 18 for tau two. And uh, it seems there's a lot of time for it to execute. There's a lot of idle time for that. And at 11, uh, tau one has two time units to do. And there's still time until 14 if we start at 11. So we don't disturb the schedule by at 10 giving the uh, tau four the deadline of 11. So it works. So we put in the schedule. So at 10, if you look at it, what do schedule at ADF schedule decide? Of course, it will take the one with the closed deadline and that is tau four and execute that. And then it will take uh, at 11, it will take the one with the closed deadline. We have this deadline and that deadline to choose between. So we do tau one first and it comes to 13. So at 11, we have another arrival also, that is tau five. It has an execution time of, of two. And let's see if we could put, if we could put an artificial deadline of 13 in here. But if we put the artificial deadline to be 13, you can see it will have to execute from 11 to 13, but then Tau one will uh, lose its deadline because it only will execute one and we take two time units away from it. So we destroy the schedule for tau one and, and we get a missed deadline. So artificial deadline for tau five at, at 13 is, is not okay. Even if you try with 14, yeah, then uh, there was a, a, will be a fight between tau one and, and uh, tau five. So we cannot let tau five win that fight because then tau one will lose its deadline. So 13 is not, 14 is not a good choice either. So we try with 15. So if we put a artificial deadline of 15, then it will work, you can see, because tau one finishes at 13 and there is two time units left until 15. And there's no problem for tau two because when it starts at 15, it can just finish. And uh, at 16, tau one can finish at 18 and don't miss its deadline of 19. So the analysis tells us that an artificial deadline of tau, of tau five at 15 will work. So this it, it will be. And you can see at 13, when the scheduler looks who is to put in next, it will take the one with the closest deadline and that will be tau five. And this is what we'll execute. And then, then the one with the next closest deadline will be uh, tau two here, it will execute. And the next deadline will be at 19 up here. So tau one will execute. So this is slack stealing. So every time an, uh, uh, an apparatus task arrives, we try to give it an artificial deadline as early as possible without destroying the rest of the schedule. And if you cannot fit it in, we have to just throw it out. But as long as we have some idle time in the schedule, then if you do it first comes first served, we can fit it in eventually. Yeah, the last two slides is dealing with hard apparatus task scheduling. So if the apparatus task has a hard deadline, this will typically be alarm. You have to acknowledge an alarm within an acknowledge time. 
If you don't do so, the rocket will explode, as I told you. The Ariane rocket will explode. Yeah. And this was, we said that this is generally what people do out in the real life. You set a, you just make an, uh, a priority task serving the a priority uh, task. But uh, you just waste a lot of time for doing that, as I explained. Typically, an apriotic task is as seldom as a supernova is to you on the sky. So we, we sacrifice some time in the schedule for serving apriotic tasks, if you do it the simple approach. So let's look, look at two ways of handling uh, apriotic tasks with hard deadlines. So, so we look into the background when there's no past tasks already to execute. And uh, this is according to the EDF algorithm here. It's a bit strange that it could, for me, it could also be other algorithms, but in this text, they look at the idle times in the, uh, in the EDF algorithm. So they had hard timing constraints. So when you, if you accept to do them, they have to, to uh, be executed before the deadline. So that's why they are queued in a, in a queue according to the deadlines. So it will not be a first come first served. It will be the ones with the shortest deadline will be served first. So it will be a priority queue, so to speak, that you put the average task request into. So before you can accept it, you take it out from the priority queue and you make an, uh, an online acceptance test as follows. So first, you have to compute the amount of process idle time between the arrival time of the, of the priority task and its deadline. Of course, the idle time in the schedule must be big enough so you can, your priority task can do its work. So this is the first thing you have to check that you have enough idle time in the schedule. If there is enough idle time, then you have to check if you, if you are coming to conflict with the already accepted time, with the tasks that you prioritize you have in the schedule and the already accepted task uh, that you have put into the schedule. So if you have put in two priority tasks into the schedule, you also have to check that they still can execute. So if no uh, deadlines are violated by putting the priority tasks into the, uh, to the task set. So if there's not an idle time and the acceptance of the abroad task don't uh, uh, cause other threats to, to miss the deadlines, then you accept it. Otherwise you reject it. So similar to a golf club, sometimes you can be accepted as a member in the golf club if they have enough time on the, on the lanes. But if there is not enough time on the lanes, they will not allow you in into the golf club. Even if you have a rich a billionaire, you will not be allowed in if there is no available time on the lanes. Yeah, it's a bit silly example. So this is a hard background scheduling of every task for, for, for this <coughs> background scheduling. So we fill in, we fill in the empty periods in the schedule. Let's see here what we can do. So in the example, we have a, an arrival at four. And we look, do we have enough idle time? Within the deadline, we have a deadline of 10. So you can see we have actually two units of time available before 10. So we can fit it into the schedule. And let's see, do we disturb the other deadlines? No, because it's a strict idle time here. So tau one has executed up to five and tau, and uh, tau two has executed up to eight. So we don't disturb anyone by putting tau four into this interval. Let's see tau five, we put it in, it arrives at 10, execution time of one, deadline of 18. And let's see where is the next idle time. Yeah, we can put it, we can actually put it uh, up here if you like or we could put it here. 
So, just to make sure we don't uh, destroy anything for anyone, we can we can put it in this interval. Then at 11, tau 6 arrives, it has a deadline of 16, and it needs two time units to execute, and we can put it into this schedule, into this idle time that we have up here. And now it works. So we can accept all of them. Hard joint scheduling of aperiodic and periodic tasks. In this way, we'll let the EDF scheduler work. So, when a new aperiodic task enters the system, a new EDF scheduler will be built. And this consists of the periodic tasks that we have and the already accepted aperiodic tasks that we have in the, in the set and the new request. If this schedule is feasible, if we meet all the deadlines, then we accept the new request into the club of the accepted ones. Otherwise, we reject it. So this is a way to do it if we use joint scheduling. And remember joint scheduling, as we saw it here. Yeah, we assigned fictive deadlines in the joint schedule normally. But now we don't have fictive deadlines, we have real deadlines of all the library tasks. So we fit in a new request and it has a deadline. And if this deadline ruins the game for the already, uh, for those we already have in the schedule, then we, re we reject it. Otherwise we accept it. So it's pure logic. And down here we have an example. This is the last slide, so we can start breathing, breathe again. Yeah, so in this slide, of course, you know, these helpers from these mighty processor, professors, they are lazy, so they do copy pastes. And uh, this is only one long, but it's depicted as two. Is there up here also? No, here it's depicted correctly. So there's only one long. <laughs> and uh, in the solution, they only use one time unit. So let's see, it has a deadline of 10. And uh, can it be served before 10? There's a deadline at seven for tau one. So it starts executing first. And at four, here, yeah, tau two has executed. So its next deadline is at nine. So it has a closer deadline. So we can execute here at tau three here has a deadline of eight. So it has a closer deadline than tau two. So it has to execute from five to six. And from six to eight, we'll put in a tau two because the tau four has a deadline of 10. So can we fit it in? Yes, at eight, we have spare time now, so we can fit it in. This means that we accept tau four because we just have time enough to before 10 in the schedule so we can fit in. So at, at 10, tau five arrives. It has only one time unit to do and has deadline of 18. And let's see if we can fit it into the schedule. So tau one has finished its job at tau two as a deadline of 14. This means that it has to execute before tau five, which has a deadline of 18. And tau three has a deadline of 18 also. So we have a choice between these two. So of course we have to look at the one who, which is already accepted. So it will have to go first. So at 15, we have some time available. So it, because it has a deadline of 16, we can accept it uh, at 18, sorry. So we can accept its execution. So we'll execute from 15 to 16. And uh, it's a bit confusing because this the deadline of tau five is this uh, over here. So tau five is, is, is accepted <coughs> into the schedule. 
because it can be handled before 18. So six arrives at 11 and has a deadline of 16. And let's see if we can fit it into the schedule. So if you look in the schedule, tau two has a deadline at 14. So it has to execute also. And tau three has a deadline of 18. It has to execute. Yeah, it executes here. And tau, uh, tau six, no tau five was put into the schedule. Yeah, it has a deadline of 18. And uh, it has completion time of two, it's deadline of 16. Can we fit it into the schedule? Is the deadline of 16? And the answer is actually yes, because it arrives at 11. Of course, it will not execute before tau two. So we have to wait until that one. But then we can let it start because tau three has the deadline of 18. So because uh, tau six has the deadline of 16, it will execute here. And now tau three will execute from 14 to 15. And uh, tau, <coughs> tau four, no, tau five, sorry, was accepted. It will execute from 15 to 16 because uh, tau three has uh, done its job. So it will execute until 16. And notice the deadline belonging to tau five is 18 up here. So this uh, 16 is the deadline of, of tau six. So it can be fit into schedule and we are satisfied. Then we allow tau six to participate in the schedule. We allow it at 11. So, excuse me, for yes. a question. Uh, because uh, tau, tau five and uh, tau three has the same uh, absolute deadline, which is 18. Uh, yeah. Can, can, can we replace uh, like, that that the uh, tau five happens before tau three. Yeah, but uh, so only only after only after the acceptance time. What do you mean? Yeah. Mm. So you you first you you look at the schedule. Can you put it in without say uh, without missing deadlines for for the, those who is already accepted? And we can do that. So the choice we have. At 10, at 10 we put in with a deadline of 18. And then uh, as you see, there's a free choice between doing tau three and doing uh, tau five here in the schedule because they have the same deadline. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And here we just let tau three do it because it was earlier in the schedule. But you could also uh, choose to do uh, tau five from 14 to 15. Okay. As a, but before tau six arrives, the choice was at 12, you see. At 12, you should choose between tau three and tau five. And it will work because we don't sacrifice any deadlines. So at 12, you know, tau two has executed and tau five has a lot of time before 18 to execute. Because we later on accept tau six, and it has the shortest deadline, it will execute from 12 to 14. But there's still room in the schedule to execute uh, tau three and tau five, because they have a deadline of 18. So no trouble. Okay. So this line is written, uh, so the schedule is written after we have accepted tau six at 11. Then we write what happens. So the acceptance criteria works, yeah, for these three tasks. But you have to keep a little awake in order to explain the figure. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Otherwise, I think we have deserved a break now. Any comments in the, there's an old comment in the, uh, from Abdul, do they act like watchdog? Is this an old message, Abdul, or what? Yeah, it was an old question, and I got the answer to that. But now I have another question. It's yes. about 
the sporadic server? I think Mayron asked it, but I still didn't understand. Yeah. The, the replenish time is basically the time when the uh, sporadic server wakes up, right? Yeah, it for, from it wakes up and you start using the capacity. So it's from this point on, and then five up to here. It's a bit strange this rule because you would expect that the replenishment time is from when the, you have used up the capacity and then go up here. Yeah. But then you had the trouble here that you will never get this one time unit back before you have used it up here. So they, they said in order to, key, to make it better for the average task, we say it's from the beginning when you use it. Then there's a certain time until you replenish it again. So replenish is, I looked it up into the dictionary, the word, it's similar to a bucket of water. You use half of the water in the bucket and then you fill the water up to the top again. To the top again. This is a simple way to understand this word replenishment. You don't use it in normal English, this replenishment of something. It's a bit rare word. That's why they use it in academia, you know. <laughs> in academia, you get more academic if you use more strange words, you see. <laughs> so don't use too simple words if you are highly ranking professor. Yeah, but it's from the start of it. Yeah. You use it, and then you have five, and then you get the full bucket again. So up here at 20, they should have depicted that you got a full bucket. Yeah, but they just stopped drawing at 20. Is that okay, Abdul? Yeah, I got it now. Thank you. Yeah. And remember, when I asked this guy at Subdivision about uh, servers, he just look at me and say, server what? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll stop the recording. If there's no more question. And this will be a very long, it's a record recording now. One.